Investors Chronicle. Hello, one and all. Welcome to the Investors Chronicle Companies and Markets show. Today is Thursday, the 25th of April. We are recording, as usual, a day ahead of broadcast which means we're mere hours on from the news that UK and Australia-listed miner BHP has proposed a £30 billion takeover of rival Anglo-American. What would a combined business look like? Will the deal go through? Does it make sense? We have our own UK-Aussie hybrid Mark Robinson here to examine these issues in just a moment. Later on, we'll also be joined by Ideas editor Gemma Slingo to talk about this week's cover feature, in which fund managers share the biggest mistakes of their career. And Julian Hoffman is also here to talk about a business that's already completed its big takeover of a rival, albeit much lower down the food chain. That's the AIM-listed property franchise group, which reported full-year figures earlier this week. But there is no doubting the big story of the day. It's one that may well run and run, given the complexities of any potential deal. Mark, can you, first of all, Talk us through what BHP is offering for Anglo, the rationale of the move from its point of view and so on. Is is this all about copper? The short answer to that is yes. They're offering, a, as you say, it's about a £30 billion uh, deal for Anglo-American. Anglo would be forced to divest some of their assets in the lead up uh, to the finalisation of the deal. I, th- I think it comes in at uh, it's worth about twenty, just over twenty-five quid per share, and that's a premium of about thirty percent. Uh, it has up until midway to oh, the twenty-second of this month to make a, a firm offer. So, uh, but presumably that will be forthcoming over the next week. As you say, the copper is at the heart of the deal as well, and it's estimated that the combination uh, of the two companies would uh, result in a mining group. That accounts for about 10% of global output. Uh, as I say, it'll Anglo-American will have to divest its stakes in Amplats and uh, Cumber Iron Ore. That would be a, a fairly drawn-out process in itself. Anglo, at the moment, it, it focuses on maybe six core segments at the moment. As I mentioned, Iron Ore, uh, Amplats. But there's an Iron Ore business in Brazil as well. Still got some uh, coal assets too, and base metals, uh, such as nickel, a nickel rather. It's got phosphate interest too, up in uh, Yorkshire and elsewhere, and uh, of course it's got the the uh, Beers Diamond subsidiary. Uh, we, it's got an eighty-five percent stake in that as well. Mm-hmm. Chances are, I think that the Beers would be hived off. Uh, after the deal as well, because there's difficulties in that uh, in that market, and it's been a bit of a drag on Anglo-American over the last uh, couple of years, actually. Yeah, as you say, the breakdown there is quite notable, really. That BHP doesn't seem to want a lot of these things. I think they've said that the diamonds business would be reviewed post-completion if we we get that far. Um, They've also said, as you point out, that the South African businesses, uh, Amplats uh, being the main one there, they don't want. So they want them demerged beforehand, which could be a complicated situation in terms of who's going to buy them. Also, in terms of the fact that South Africa's got an election next month and politically, that may be a pretty sensitive move as well. But the the whole idea is, it seems, is, isn't it, that BHP is going to double down further on copper following the Oz Minerals deal a couple of years ago. I mean, right now, BHP is, what, 59% iron ore, quarter copper. That copper would get up closer to 30%, I think, if the deal went through. Can we talk a bit about Anglo's current situation and and why it's been struggling? I should say, uh, I forgot to uh, give you credit at the top, but you did write uh, just three weeks ago that uh, your piece, Anglo, could soon be a takeover target, which uh, has very quickly come to fruition. And part of that is because it has had some struggles and it has uh, had some downgrading of its own prospects in recent months. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, part of the, when I was um, uh, putting that article together, I was was wondering actually what would happen in terms of those South African assets, because as things stand, there were a few of those would definitely fall under the 
you know, it'd be extremely difficult to incorporate some of these assets. It would present the logistical problems for BHP. Um, Amplats itself uh, has um, been troubled over the last few years by various issues, including uh, industrial disputes as well, and these haven't been these haven't been put to bed yet. Uh, I, I suppose the overriding issue for Amplats is is just there's been a fall away in uh, Platinum Group uh, metals prices in recent times. All of this comes back to uh, the the dearth of, of supply in uh, the automotive industry. Platinum producers had built up fairly hefty inventories uh, over the last few years but then of course they we had the, the situation because of varying reasons that automotive output uh, pulled back sharply and they were left holding uh, large inventories too and you can't uh, bleed those out into the market overnight so that was that's part of the reason why pgm prices have uh, been depressed um, one would think logically over time that that would that would ease but uh, of course, Amplats has also been faced by the general industrial malaise in, in, in South Africa and specific issues linked to ESCOM, the, the national power supplier as well. Heavy industry has been uh, you know, forced to endure periods of uh, load shedding, uh, which has made production more expensive and more uh, problematic. So it's, it's hardly surprising that uh, BHP would want that on its books as well. Let's talk about the the prospects for the deal going through, whether that be uh, from an antitrust basis or also from a uh, basis that Anglo might want a bit more money or certainly Anglo shareholders might want more money and, and also someone else might come in over the top. It does feel, uh, as I say, that this might run on for some time. Yeah, it's, it is. It's, uh, it's a complex issue. And uh, as you mentioned there, uh, antitrust risk uh, is prominent there as well. I mean, part of the reason that the Coomera iron ore side is going to be sold off as well, because that could present a, an antitrust issue. Mm. But I, I, I suppose, I suppose the, the, the main one is linked again to copper. I mean, I, it, it's hard to know that 10% of the global production, does that uh, amount to a strangulation of a market? I'm not necessarily necessarily sure that's the case and it may be that uh, say this this is this could be just part of a, a bidding process too and we'll get more details once a formal offer presumably when a formal offer comes in by uh, the 22nd of uh well next month i'm sort of getting ahead of myself really so it's mm. next month I, lo I looked at the valuation and uh, and the price that's being mentioned or touted is actually slightly below the 200 day moving average. We saw, uh, again, I was reviewing the price and there was actually a, a positive uh, technical single, signal that was recorded back in May, 2023. Uh, and, but it would represent a, a decent premium to net assets, you know, uh, taking into consideration the, the divestments as well. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of doubt whether this will be the, the last price. Now, whether we get Somebody else coming into the market is open to question. It, it, it's a, definitely a scale deal as well. And BHP has the, um, the financial uh, clout to, to push forward with this too. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think this is, this is going to run for a while, this story. Yeah. I mean, BHP describe it as being, uh, you know, investing in future facing commodities. And that's certainly, as per our discussion on the show last week about copper, that's certainly the, the rationale for copper, the energy transition and what have you. And it's its key role in that process. What, what do you think of the deal from BHP's point of view? Because clearly, these kind of big integrations, while they can sound positive and there can be economies of scale as uh, you note there can often also be value destructive can't they so do you think this makes sense from a bhp point of view do you think it's something that has to be done or is it opportunistic given anglo's current price it, it would certainly be opportunistic in a sense based on recent price history it doesn't look that bad but once that uh, pgm market comes back into some sort of demand supply balance. We should have seen valuations for Anglo-American pick up. I mean, De Beers has been a slight drag on uh, the valuation process too. 
And that's why I, I think it, it'd be surprising if the the offer stays in its its, its current form. Um, in terms of the the assets that we'll be acquiring, I mean, a, a, a lot of the ones once Amplatz is out of the way and once Cumbria Iron Ore is out of the way, they're located in fairly low risk locales as well. And uh, I guess you know, uh, as you say, BHP is looking at the type of minerals that will you know drive the energy transition and sort of nickel's part of that as well. It's also um, it's also got um, that interesting stake in the polyhalite uh, uh, site up in in Whitby in Yorkshire there, and uh, that's quite interesting as well because I think uh, BHP have had uh, uh, been in the fertilizer market previously. Anglo did signal fairly recently that they were going to uh, prioritise investment in that side in North Yorkshire as well at the expense of its uh, current production sites in South Africa and, and Chile. That would be an interesting addition to the BHP portfolio as well. I mean, I guess, you know, we have a look at um, its main uh, rival in the market, Rio Tinto. I think both of the big iron ore producers are looking to diversify uh, away from iron ore because i mean you know it, it's going to remain you know the, the 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 real driver of revenue and cash flows for both these groups going forward but i think they recognize that uh, china's growth characteristics aren't what they were so you know they, they're looking at a more strategic uh, positioning with, with regards to copper so you know, it's it's sort of uh, explicable from from that perspective i think Mm. The the Woodsmith angle is interesting from a UK point of view. This was the business Anglo or the project Anglo acquired in the serious minerals deal a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. There is some analyst suggestion this morning, though, that because BHP has potash exposure in Canada, it may delay the Woodsmith project or feel like it. I mean, clearly, we're several steps ahead here, uh, talking about what it would do with that relatively small asset if it completes this big deal. The other suggestion is, I mean, the, the big question in the short term, the first question is whether Anglo engages with this deal, whether they they reject it outright or whether they have to mount a, a defence. There's been some suggestion that protecting their status as an independent company would itself involve some disposals and things like that to show that they can create value in the business themselves. But we will have to keep a close eye on it. I think we mentioned it before, but obviously with the elections in South Africa this year, that's going to have a, a major bearing on the form of the deal, or, or it could certainly do that, particularly if the ANC lose their parliamentary majority, because then they may have to go into, there's a there's an outside possibility that they'd have to go into coalition then with some fringe parties in South Africa, some of whom are committed towards uh, nationalisation measures as well. That's that seems a little unlikely uh, in the greater scheme of things, but uh, who can say? This this is one we're going to be covering in, in the magazine for a while. In fact, on that point you made before about Woodsmith as well, we had internal arguments in the magazine about the viability of serious minerals. So uh, yeah. the good burgers at BHP can get in contact with us on that score if they like. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, the viability of uh, these businesses at least is not in question, but... You're right, there's certainly going to be plenty more twists and turns along the way this year, I think. And we'll see whether it turns out to be a good idea. On the subject of which, our cover feature this week is all about bad ideas, or rather big mistakes that investors have made over the years. Gemma, you spoke to a variety of fund managers who, as is their want, invest in all kinds of different companies and have experience over several decades doing so, to uh, get a sense of their, their worst calls. Can you talk, first of all, about the thinking behind the piece? I think the idea, as Fed say, is about the lessons they've learned rather than just uh, us pointing and laughing at them. Yes, yeah, very much so. So I thought you often hear professionals talking about their successes and what's gone right, and that's obviously very natural, but often it's just as enlightening, if not more enlightening, to hear about what's gone wrong. And often quite comforting, I suppose, from a retail investor perspective or sort of an investment writer perspective when you realise actually these mistakes are quite universal and nobody can have a sort of flawless track record. 
So I set out to try and talk to as many fund managers who would have me and basically ask what was their biggest mistake, how did it happen and what they learned from them. And yeah, we got loads of really interesting responses. So hopefully it will be an interesting and quite an entertaining read as well. Mm. It is a good reminder sort of as a first principle, isn't it, that investing is about the mistakes as much as the successes. We have a, a complimentary feature this week from Mark Lauber, a small cap investor, and he talks about you only really need a 55% hit rate, really, to make some good money overall, but that does imply a lot of uh, failures along the way. You can now get 12 weeks of an Investor's Chronicle print and digital subscription for just £12. You'll get instant access to our website and our app, plus the magazine delivered to your door every week. Check the terms and conditions in the show notes for more information. Let's talk about a couple of examples from the piece. We won't go into all of them. Uh, there were a variety of interesting different mistakes and kinds of mistakes, ways you can group them. But one, let's start with uh, the manager who invested in Curry's. It was quite interesting and a relatively recent uh, episode, something that, that caught them unawares. Yeah, that one really struck me. And generally, it was useful because the fund managers were quite willing to give specific examples because I was worried mm. there'd be a lot of general wisdom. But no, um, the Curry's example was interesting because they basically set out their investment case. And, you know, they said they looked at all the big potholes, lease liabilities, possible slowdown in big ticket item sales, all that sort of thing. And they thought they'd covered all the basic groundwork. But what unstuck them essentially was a very small part of Curry's business based in Scandinavia, which they'd basically overlooked when they were doing their research or had thought it won't cause major, major issues. But ultimately, it did cause issues because trouble with the trading in Scandinavia ultimately caused the dividend to be suspended, which the market obviously didn't like, and that really hurt the investment case. So it was a useful lesson, basically, in just to absolutely know a company inside out and don't overlook things which you think, oh, maybe that looks a bit bit rocky, but it's only a small part of the investment case, so we won't worry about it too much. They are sort of the potential for little things to unseat your unseat your thinking, I guess. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we discussed that. I remember on the, the show at the time, and it's all well us discussing it at that moment, but beforehand, you, the inclination would have been to think, well, this is only X percent of the business. How badly wrong can it go? The answer is sometimes it, it can have a ripple effect and, and an effect on the wider company. Uh, another example was you spoke to uh, Lee Hemsworth from Fidelity and and uh, he gave some good examples from early on in his career. He's a fund manager who's been around for, for quite a while now. Uh, but early on in his career, some lessons he's he's kept to this day. Yes. So one that stuck with, with me, he said um, he was very excited by this biotech company, which at the time seemed to hold the secret to treating varicose veins. Um, and everyone was getting very excited about this. And he put quite a lot of, of money in it in a professional capacity. And basically it all unraveled at one of the stages of the trials because it realised the treatment that had seemed so magical wasn't actually working as well as everyone thought it would. Well, he warned basically of the risks of investing in companies that you don't fully understand. And I suppose that is something that is such a problem when it comes to biotech stocks, because if you're thinking about a retailer or even an industrial company, you can sort of get your head around what it does. You might have had experience of, of going to the company or interacting with them in some way. But with biotechs, unless you are an expert in that field, it's so hard to know basically, A, what the product is, whether it works, and whether people will want it. So it was a, a useful lesson in sort of picking sectors, I suppose, when you're thinking about where you want to invest. And he also made the point, you know, with the investment chron Investors Chronicle, readers probably have very niche specialisms where they know loads of stuff about a particular area. And, you know, that's a real, can be a real goldmine, you know, if they make, make the most of that and invest in areas that they know, they might really stand out from the crowd. Mm. I mean, we do hear this fairly... It's a fairly common thing, isn't it, to only invest in what you know. But he has really stuck with that to the extent that he, since that point, has never invested in the entire sector again. I don't know if that's... Oh, I've just made that up. He definitely said he was warier of it and he's very much guided by the analysts and external advice, but you can't ever get as comfortable with the stock if you don't fully understand it, I mm. think. Maybe he has invested in the sector again. We haven't got the uh, the full spreadsheet of his career with us. 
Another aspect, which we again uh, mentioned on the podcast last week in our discussion of Terry Smith and some of his comments about buying and selling, is uh, this conundrum of holding for too long versus selling too soon. And of course, these are always movable feasts, but there, there were some important points there as well, I think. That seemed to come up again and again when I was talking to fund managers either lamenting that they'd had this fantastic company and they'd lost their nerve and sold it and they lost all the future returns they could have enjoyed. Um, and it, it seemed to be particularly troublesome, an idea when sort of things get turbulent. So if the market's starting to get rocky and you're getting nervous, there's this big push to, I don't know, do something. And that often seems to be a mistake. But on the other end of the spectrum, you had fund managers talking about companies which they'd got too attached to either because they knew the management team really well or they'd held it for ages and really liked the business but ultimately the signs were saying it was time to to get rid and they didn't. Mm. Well one perhaps less well-known area is management incentives insofar as it makes sense to be aware of the incentives and makes sense to keep an eye on them but sometimes investors may struggle to join the dots between what those incentives are and what the implications can be for a business as well. I think so. So one of the things that was flagged was always look deep into the company accounts at the sort of governance and incentive pages. So you can see how are the management team being remunerated and has there been sort of shareholder disquiet about what's going on? So if you look back and see past general meetings you can see how sort of the voting went and that's often quite a useful indicator of whether people are getting a bit nervous but I think usefully from a retail investor perspective you can get lots of information from company accounts it's not simply a case of chatting to the management team or you know being able to have one-to-one interactions with the company you can get huge amounts of data from what's published online. Mm. And of course, it's not just about the the overall salary. It's about where in the business those you know bonus schemes are being focused on and what metrics they have to meet. And that, if nothing else, it might not tell you a company's going to go wrong, but it might tell you what they're going to focus on at the expense of other things. Exactly, and sort of how they're able to achieve certain metrics is always something to to look out for. I think, but as yeah. I say, it's often buried quite deep in a company's annual reports. Mm. Well, we have some good uh, examples in the piece as well uh, to. To illustrate that a bit more, uh, philosophical question to, to conclude this segment. Is it fair enough to say when we think a lot of this is behavioural finance, uh, we can look at these lessons and we can try and learn from them. But in some ways, are we destined to repeat some of these mistakes in perpetuity just by our very nature? By um, I don't mean individual natures, although that probably adds to it as well, but just by human nature. How easy is it to eliminate some of these mistakes? tricky I reckon I mean I don't have any hard data on it but when I was speaking to these professionals it often struck me how focused they were on the behavioral side of things you know managing your own emotions and your own panic or confidence and it was less in some ways less to do with actually what a company's accounts are saying and more to do with what's going on in your own head and I do think it must be extremely hard to get over the particular biases we all have. But hopefully by flagging them, at least investors might be more aware of them when they they crop up in their own minds and their own investment decisions. Yeah, in that other feature I mentioned, uh, Mark does talk about writing down almost every transaction or certainly every, not every transaction, but every interesting lesson and every outcome that maybe went slightly differently compared with how you thought it might go because then you have a record you can look back over and that probably helps when you're reviewing these situations because it can be very easy to say oh I'll never do that again and then in two or three years time you've forgotten that scenario and and it happens again. Exactly and I think the temptation if something goes wrong is to be like oh well I just won't look at that very much or I must have been very unlucky rather than to fully reflect on it. That idea of writing things down cropped up somewhere else as well one of the fund managers said you know they always made a detailed written note of why they were investing in something what the appeal was and when they wanted to get out Mm. and that helped sort of avoid some of those psychological issues that people encountered indeed well that is our cover story this week so as ever if you are uh, interested in the subject do have a look online pick up a copy of the magazine and there's a lot more detail in there in both features For now, though, we are turning to our result of the week, which is Property Franchise Group, as I mentioned at the top. Uh, Julian, you uh, covered 
these full year figures for us. It's another company that's gone through a, uh, well, a company that's gone through a merger recently. The whole BHP Anglo thing is very much in the early stages, of course. It's bought Belvoir Homes, a pronunciation I really resent as a Leicestershire native because that's where Belvoir Castle is, except in Leicestershire, it's pronounced Beaver because in the Middle Ages, no one could pronounce the French word Belvoir. And therefore, I think this company should be called Beaver Property Group. But that's a big digression. Uh, anyway, Gillian, what are the results say the results were largely irrelevant which uh, is one of those rare occasions or at least uh, um, occasions where um, a merger has sort of made them largely historic instantly but it was useful it's in a sense we got to talk to the management uh, who were very pleased with themselves about having pulled off this um, particular merger with uh, Beaver or Belvoir however you want to uh, describe it and it's uh, an interesting case of the two largest companies in one sector actually joining up and consolidating that position um, at the very top of the the estate agent sector. And uh, they're doing it in a way really just to get um, out of uh, what they self-described as a sort of rut in that uh, neither company could seem to get its market capital 110 million. And um, the only way they could... uh, a sea of breaking out of that particular um, trough was to merge and create a new, entirely new type of company, really. And uh, it's, a, it's a, an interesting uh, exercise, really, uh, in, in in just of trying to play the market as you see it. And um, uh, it, it means now that uh, Belvoir or, you know, Franchise Property Group is now the the single largest estate agent in the country, at least by number of outlets, uh, most of which are franchised to people who run them. So it's uh, yeah, a, a very uh, interesting and um, uh, probably timely as well as the, the the market seems to be on the move for both uh, lettings and sales at the moment. Mm. That that size is, uh, as you say, given to it by the franchise model. Can you say a little bit about that? Because it is a bit different from just being a, a straightforward estate agent. They do, uh, you know, rely heavily on that as a as a way to grow, and that is very much the unique string to their bow compared with most estate agents. It is. It's, um, they obviously then it means that unlike say uh, foxes, they don't actually own anything. So when you look at the balance sheet, there's very little capital invested property or uh, tangible assets, which in a sense is a, a positive because that obviously that, that eats up capital. And uh, instead they invest in, you know, they have to invest in a very big support system for franchisees who want to take on one of their brands um, and they'll rent uh, our property on their behalf. And uh, obviously, there's a, sh- a profit share system that uh, that works through that. I, as far as I can see, it, it is a way of minimizing risk uh, for the company because they don't need then to leverage in order to support bricks and mortar in high streets all over the country. It becomes much more of a like a McDonald's type uh, operation in a way. And it allows whoever wants to run um, a local agent to the, the local knowledge in order to, uh, to to try and get the best out of the market. I think that's... Uh, uh, another significant advantage as well of having a, a franchise model rather than um, using a sort of centrally uh, mandated way of selling everything. Mm. Certainly incentive wise, these these companies, obviously, they run their own businesses. So you would hope that would help as well with uh, with profitability, productivity and, and so on. Exactly. So they, there, there are different ways of incentivizing people. So they, they you know, this this one is essentially a profit share and um, it, it uh, allows them more individual freedom uh, in the, in order to develop the the business they way the, the way they want to develop it, and uh, mm. uh, it, it seems to ride on that um, that entrepreneurial sort of local entrepreneurial spirit, um, and uh, it, it it's developed really in a way that um, perhaps the more fixed um, the fixed uh, property uh, agents can't, uh, you know. <laughs> In that, if a, if a franchise isn't working in a particular place, they can just uh, close it down without any significant loss. They might pay, uh, might post a few intangible assets that have to be written off, but uh, it doesn't mean that you're 
left with an empty building that you then have to lease out or or sell at a loss. So the, yeah, the cost model is very low. So Belvoir and um, and franchise they they both have very similar businesses in that respect. So the 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 combination was quite straightforward, uh, and they don't actually get in each other's way. So. Uh, Belvoir, um, as you alluded to, um, is more of a middle to north England, um, northern England uh, business and uh, franchise is more concentrated on the south, which uh, you can tell by the fact that they're headquartered in Bournemouth, gives you an idea of where they tend to sell their, you know, where their agents tend to be based. Um, so you, they're not not having to massively consolidate by, you know, mm. by closing down branches on the same high street, which is which could be a problem if you were if you're buying another national chain. Yeah. As you say, the, the franchise business, it does have a, a bit of a heritage in the, in the UK market as well, doesn't it? With the, the likes of Domino's and franchise brands who we've discussed, uh, another smaller company we discussed on the show a few months ago. So there is some, uh, you know, it's not so much a trend, although three things are sometimes a trend for journalists, aren't they? But there's definitely a indication that it can be a successful business model. What it does produce in this case as well is, is fairly high margins, decent returns on equity for the business too. Ultimately, though, it is in a relatively cyclical sector, i.e. The, the housing market. Uh, I suppose one other rationale for the deal might be it gives it a little bit more in the letting side of the business. Property franchise already was quite big on lettings. Uh, Belvoir was even bigger though, so it gives them uh, that side of the business, which is a little bit more stable maybe because housing transactions are going to fluctuate, of course. So I mean, combined, they sell about 28,000 houses a year, but I mean, as you know, it's it's a very lumpy, it's a very lumpy business. It needs a lot of time before you realize, you know, yeah, we've all, we've all bought a house at some point. We know how consuming it is. But the letting side is uh, is interesting. Again, that's geographically spread. So, you know, the north and south, there's a north-south division in that in it. And, um, but no, you know, with the merger now, they're, they're not trying to compete in the same area. So that, that that's another positive for them. And uh, the combined number of um, clients on their books is, is absurd. It's something like 9 million um mm. potential uh, people that they have on the books who could go into letter into lettered properties and it's now really by by branch definitely the largest estate agent in the country so it's got 910 branches the second largest is a private uh company called countrywide so they yeah they're some distance ahead of the competition now so there, there's definitely a, an element of scale there which is much to their advantage uh, they have been relatively acquisitive over the the years uh, and yeah, a lot of that growth does seem to come from acquisition rather than productivity, you, you could say. I mean, maybe that's a, a partial view, but but they do seem to be, with this deal in particular, uh, as you've alluded to, because it's complementary, they're not looking for synergies. They're looking for that increase in scale and yes. looking to grow that way. Yeah, they're actually putting more money into stuff, which is, is, is kind of a counterintuitive. Usually after a merger, uh, they will have fun sort of getting rid of loads of people, but um, uh, in this case, uh, when I spoke to the management, they said, "Well, their main priority is um, that there isn't really the automatic synergies you get from from location. So they they find it better to develop the business, um, you know, with more support staff rather than um, just trying to find savings for the sake of it." So there's, yes, it's a uh, it's an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting development, and hopefully, I mean, it has shown up in the market cap. Obviously, the market cap since the merger has now doubled by default because obviously you have two similar sized companies with similar size, similar levels of profit uh, coming together. So they're now over two hundred thirty million or something, and they both struggled to get past uh, one hundred ten million when they were independently listed. Um, so there, there, there might be a premium that comes in. Um, as the market improves in terms of lettings and sales this year. Yeah, I mean, that's the other aspect to this uh, story, isn't there? The fact we have them on a buy, and, and you would hope that uh, the property market would improve or continue to improve. We've seen some green shoots this year, uh, uh, as and when interest rates come down and as and when economic growth returns, as it seems to be starting to to do so. That, unfortunately, does bring us to the end of today's show, though we have run out of time. Thank you very much to Julian, to Gemma, to Mark and to our producer Maddie Apthorpe. We'll be back next week with another Companies and Market Show. <laughs>